Welcome back to another episode of Liberty and Morality Defined Presents. Majority privilege, not white privilege. This comes and goes as a topic in various forums. In the United States, it's been a fairly common topic among various chat rooms and internet forums in 2016 and 2015. It's often fueled by racist concepts and a misunderstood history so many talking heads on mainstream news outlets incorrectly invoke. It's also a topic that is mixed with authority and power and wealth, where those with the ability to make laws or spend money wildly to purchase loyalty seem to be the problem. While it's not as much about skin color as so many seem to confuse it with exclusively, it's about a failure to correctly identify context. This idea of white privilege gets hyped up when law enforcement, uh, law enforcement kills or harasses or otherwise hurts a black or non-white individual they decide to interact with in the performance of their governmental duties. I could share a list of sources showcasing how white law enforcers stop, harass, and otherwise hurt more whites, including kill them, than they do non-whites. But what's the point? I could also explain how this translates into jury indictments and judges' rulings, Popular culture and social stigmas don't react the same way to a white man being interacted with as negatively it seems as they do with a black individual regardless of gender or other non-white individuals also regardless of gender or even white females. I could share how much more whites struggle to survive uh, hardships economically in total numbers are standing before a judge and what their persecution or prosecution rates are uh, counted total than blacks. I'm not talking percentages, but once more, what's the point since media manipulation mixed with uh, personal political goals uh, spread divisive hate and labeling when a story is reported about a white man murdering a black man when the issue is about murder and the motive concerning self-defense? Why bring up race when the issue is about one human killing another, either in defense and self-defense or not? Such is universally deemed wrong if in self-defense. If not in self-defense, I mean. The, the focus should, should be on understanding the context of, of every possible stimulant that could affect the actions of an individual. There are, there are far more stimuli than just racial discrimination. So jumping on that bandwagon is just, why? Until you know all the facts. And in the case of what is understood as white privilege, it would be a failure to not understand historical context with visible popular culture and fads being anti-discrimination while the legal system is ripe with so many laws proclaimed to help. But they only focus on the racial aspect of, or, or socially divisive aspects, that is, of why a crime was committed. Take, for example, hate crimes and killing people because they are black or homosexual. The, the legality shouldn't care why the individual killed the victim for any other reason than doing so in self-defense and that context. If murder is wrong because it's about the termination of another human life, then skin color has nothing to do with that. Sex has nothing to do with that. But defense of oneself does. By going out and discussing these trivial issues like racially motivated killing or hostilities instead of the quality of the character committing the act against the quality of the victim's character, Division is created among those not overly keen to improve their intellectual abilities. The issue is not in skin color granting favoritism. The issue is about control, critical thinking skills concerning individual survival and resource acquisition, and the most common connections with others. If the tables were absolutely even in terms of 10 white males and 10 black males, all equal in every aspect, including all 20 having moderate but not low or high intelligence, same languages, and everything else except for their skin color. How much would they consider risking a group fight to the death because their skin colors are different? Would they even consider the possibility of such future outcomes at all concerning peace in their lives because of generational grudges being handed down, or would that be entirely what they would focus on? Critical thinking skills in context of the situation is what the issue is about. Why do people put others uh, down when it's not to, to the immediate benefit of their self-defense? Absolutely, money can play a role in this. But 
it is often just a factor employed by opportunity and calculated tactics to intentionally divide people seeking to profit uh, to profit from them you to be a distraction most often this is done uh, politically by those keen on having power for their personal benefit like the Rothschilds but if the languages of these men were to be changed where all the black men spoke one language and all the white men spoke another language what would the situation be then fear of the unknown is the culprit here and if a bad idea not thought through all the way takes hold akin to the best defense is a good offense then there is reason to fear one another because of the misunderstood context of actions they would simply be at one another's throats because they are trying to get rid of something they don't understand which instills fear in them instead of realizing the potential of a greater set of future allies in the struggle of life to survive and that in the now destructive thinking is the problem when chosen skin color has very little to do with this issue overall in fact if skin color had any significant and deeply intellectual effect on white privilege and the proclaimed superiority then perhaps i wouldn't have had the experiences i did in high school i wouldn't have been faced with five six seven eight nine or more black male students asserting their numerical superiority and lack of respect of their futures over me in the back of a bus i was targeted because of my skin color due to their shallow intellectual reasons but also because of me being the minority in the area and other differences in comparison to them control is what they exerted over me for the boosting of their own poorly invested self-pride i certainly wouldn't remember their greasy fingers on my face while the other black students ignored the situation of the only white individual on that bus most mornings i wouldn't remember their horrid breath in my nostrils i wouldn't remember their tightly clenched fists in my gut and my lower back i wouldn't remember fighting to hold back my tears so they wouldn't have any visible satisfaction in knowing they successfully intimidated me and i certainly wouldn't remember the look of a middle-aged short black female bus driver looking at me each day as i climbed onto that bus to test my resolve she was just as scared as the other students were at least i like to think so in her defense they hid in their majority group of black skin color to not have to stand up to the minority group in their own majority group because such conflict would put them at risk of being targeted by the seemingly powerful aggressive and combative minority group in their majority group of relatively peaceful black counterparts notice peace was what they wanted but they were afraid of it so their skin color really doesn't matter because the context of the situation was that they were afraid of those troublemakers the peaceful let me get demolished because they wanted to avoid attracting the attention of the destructive during those weeks i had little choice but to sit in the back of the bus where the troublemakers were there were seats available in the front but my use of them was rejected by other students even though there were always empty seats with the back with the with the uh, students in the, uh, the the black students in the back of the uh, or the students and black students in the front i wasn't allowed to sit with them this wasn't because of racial reasons my presence in the front of that bus was rejected because the troublemakers in the back of the bus would have made their way to the front to pick on me and whoever i sat near so they chose to protect themselves by letting me fend for myself and be the distraction from potential hostilities i was the individual they decided to sacrifice to the bear roaming around instead of grouping together and fighting the bear off that's not privilege of being white it's the unfortunate result of being a minority where critical thinking skills moral philosophy and compassion aren't developed fully if at all where fear reigns supreme in the moment that's all that was some will call that children just being children or me just being a whiny little expletive but the truth of the matter is that such ridicule is simply misunderstood context or the rejection of greater clarity at least that was true from my experience concerning my junior year the following year i went to a much wealthier white majority populated school as my parents moved from the area the unfortunate experiences didn't fade they simply changed criteria for why i was allowed to be bullied i drove a 1972 osmobile or i rode the bus as a senior the following year there that was a horrendous uh 
that was a that was just a horrendous experience for me as the parking lot was typically filled with BMWs and Mercedes Benz and other rather expensive automobiles. The problem wasn't entirely that these people were horrid souls. It was absolutely about confidence on my part and myself and confidence on their part and themselves as well as their understanding of authority and compassion in relation to mine. And where skin color was the issue in my previous school, blatant displays of wealth re uh, replaced that in my new school. These students had wealthy parents and looked down on others. It was a rich versus poor, but majority versus minority still. I was in the minority. It wouldn't be until years later that I would understand the context of the situation I was in when I read about how most minds do not fully develop critical thinking skills until their mid to late 20s. I don't know the science behind much of that. It sounds as if it could hold some truth to it, but for me, I know that I was not fully developed intellectually in terms of internal security until I was nearly 30. This is in large part due to the authoritarian nature of my father, who never realized the negative results of his temper or what his, what his temper had on a three-year-old boy and through his 20s. Instead of trying to understand my situation as a junior, I was ridiculed by him for not standing up for myself on the bus, despite the fact that it was a death sentence to challenge half a dozen stronger students than I, even with martial arts training. And challenging them otherwise would have only escalated the situation in such a hostile environment where where that of eastern Atlanta was more heavily black populated than other parts. The following year, I knew it was a mistake uh, to discuss my troubles with my father about the other students because, because he had an air of superiority about him that I didn't understand and he couldn't explain, which would have just simply led to me being uh, ridiculed as a wimp as he was prone to do uh, to do so jokingly and seriously with prior experiences I had with him. Clarity of individual context is what the idea of privilege is all about, and if individuals are like-minded or, or have other similar traits, they'll group together. Pending their intellectual capabilities, their actions on how they interact with minorities will be either positive and peaceful, peacefully inclusive, or hostile and destructive. Now consider my situation in high school where I was dealing with other emotionally and intellectually immature minds, and voila! It was easy for immature minds to improve their ego temporarily and dangerously at the expense of hurting another, potentially causing blowback in the future for the aggressor. Of course, the moment that another got the best of the aggressor was the moment that his or her hollow pride, the, the pride of the aggressor, would be destroyed. And then they'd end up on the receiving end of such fear they invoked in others, but didn't truly understand when they invoked such power for their gains. And that is what all this white privilege is about. However, the peer pressure of high school doesn't end at graduation. Collective conformity continues on outside of high school. It can take the shape of many different forms. In the case of law enforcement, if the head of the department is aggressive and not confronted to be taught otherwise successfully, it may attract other aggressive personalities. Or, the way the various laws end up working together may craft training programs which subtly encourage aggression towards those whom are more dissimilar than they are. The problem is not race to be sure. The problem is how people identify and acquire information in order to piece the puzzle of context together in each interaction. And that is what is most important. We can look at this and see how it works around the world and in history. The truth is that we need to be able to assess threats. And if someone looks more like we do, then they are seemingly more likely to get a pass or cause less initial distress. If they do not look like us but speak the same language, we may be more likely to interact and get to know them better than those who do not speak the same language as we do. It's all about understanding context of available avenues to remove those fears in the moment, but not at the expense of the most productive potential future outcomes. We fear what we do not understand or agree with, especially in the moment. This is true even for those boys who caused me so much terror in my last half of high school. They felt the fear and pressure of their home lives or social aspects because being seen as weak by not asserting oneself is not a very desirable trait in the social circles of younger, still developing minds and hearts, pending their parents' or guardians' teachings. Fortunately, there are much easier means to understanding this fear than to incite or escalate hostilities. We are all human beings and want to be heard. 
we all have stories that we want to have listened to because it is a form of vindication for us. It tells us that we are important enough to be heard and that we are not alone. This doesn't mean that there isn't racism in the world. I'm only arguing that racism is not what fuels this white privilege that seems to portray white law enforcement and white people in general It's with being heavier handed against blacks than whites on whites. I'm sure there are many reasons, starting with the way laws are crafted, that promote such seemingly stupidity and ignorance on behalf of law enforcement and majority thinking. I also have no qualms about saying that a large part of this proclaimed white privilege is founded in the inability or founded in the ability to employ violent aggression against others by law enforcement because that is what law enforcement is all about initiating aggression. I know that seems counter to what they're supposed to do, but law enforcement believes they have a socially granted right by the majority to initiate aggression to protect themselves against those they believe are a threat to them or the society they are taught they are to protect. Even if it's in the form of a taillight being out, they will pull you over and draw a gun on you, regardless of your skin color, in the middle of the night, if they think that they're threatened. This is true even if they don't understand it because they are often following orders with, uh, without recognizing the unintended consequences of their actions, and it is socially unacceptable to pull a gun on a law enforcer, even justly, because the following headline in the news will be akin to, So-and-so murdered family man officer John Doe in your town. Are you safe from this cop killer? More at 11. I mean, of course, since blacks in the United States are still a minority in comparison to whites nationwide, it'd be more collectively acceptable to act aggressively towards them than other whites despite a lot of the contradictory nature of popular anti-discrimination sentiment. Now, this is true in part because the overwhelming majority sentiment of all people in the United States is not that racism and discrimination is bad, but that government is a necessary evil. Their words may say that racism and discrimination is bad, but their actions of tolerating government as a necessary evil override that. Because government inaction dictates that everyone may must pay or lose in order to gain and be safe collectively, it's okay to hurt others if it is for some kind of even if it is if it's so long as for some sort of greater good, supposedly. Therefore, all law enforcers get a greater pass at such things. This is what the Black Lives Matter movement should be speaking out against. Greater, or speaking out against this government intervention and promotion of hostilities. Not being angry at white people and stopping traffic, which financially hurts innocent people, likely no more intelligent than they are without regard for race, gender, or anything else other than being a motorist at the wrong time of day, and without regard for skin color at, at that. Yet, being majority is absolutely with its consequences pending the critical thinking skills desire to self-reflect and improve, as well as defining moral philosophy which is mindful of both present and future aspects equally to preserve life and property, not encourage greater risks through blowback and retaliation, requiring further hostilities and a lower chance of peace between reason-capable minds in the future. That's the difference between smart people and dumb people. The smart people think about the future and what what potential outcomes could happen, which is why they put off they put off emotional um, risks and emotional wants and desires now, oftentimes for later. So similar to before, we can take a group of five black men and a group of five white men with three in one group speaking one language and the others in the other group speaking another language and uh, speak another and the common tongues will congregate sooner with each other than non-common tongues. These people will identify more similarities with one another because they can alleviate their fears of what if concerning them through peaceful communication. The main issue will be language, and that language barrier will hold up for much longer until one or more of them begin to learn the alternate language. But if all of them spoke the same language, then race, gender, age, intelligence, and other aspects will play a more pivotal role in how they interact. Legalities only encourage division 
because it's always a poor versus which problem, a group versus group problem in politics with no politician ever truly offering the solution to simply talk to those we fear. Now, introduce divisive laws and inaccurate historical context where some of the whites' ancestors own some of the blacks' ancestors with at least half of the blacks feeling they are owed something, and the situation changes even if they speak the same language. There is division there, but why? None of what happened was directed at the present groups. None in the present groups are responsible for the actions of their forefathers. But why does it matter with the current aspect of affairs concerning the idea of white privilege? Because those invoking this concept don't understand or haven't realized that it is merely a divisive idea that creates hostilities between those whom are more emotionally controlled, can and do see the quality of character first, and recognize the aspect of future affairs and those who see something in the moment to profit because of emotional outrage. Yes, this likely can be correlated, uh, this likely correlates with uh, intelligence or the ability to control instinct and emotion for greater gains later on. For those non-whites invoking the idea that whites have privilege, they seem to often feel like they can immediately gain from the situation in terms of ideas such as government-mandated reparations for crimes committed against their ancestors and themselves because of the way history has seemingly been stacked against them. For those invoking white privilege but are white, it's because maybe they feel uh, guilty out of fear, similar to those students on, and the bus driver who didn't help me out, or they don't want, have enough information to see to fully see the context of the situation. But no matter which side this is promoted from, it's a divisive issue that is only a distraction from one thing. Creating hostility where it doesn't have any legitimate business existing is the focal point. That is what people are distracted from recognizing when invoking these shallow ideas of racial privilege without exploring the ideas deeper to understand other potential stimuli for the issues at hand. One generic experience uh, tells all because what it matches is what triggers emotional outrage in the moment for the loudest, the loudest proponents of this white privilege today, so it seems. There is no racial privilege. It merely seems like there is because of how the populace is mixed, or is it mixed? And I believe it is directly proportional to the intellectual and emotional maturity of the majority and minorities in question. If the label were changed to Catholic, then the majority being Catholic would favor other Catholics pending their maturity levels. If the label were changed to Irish, then the majority being Irish would favor other Irish. Again, pending their maturity levels. And the same holds true for my situation in high school. And just like I was able to figure it out, so too were the minorities being persecuted by Catholics, Irish, and others in the scenarios just mentioned. Interestingly enough, this is a common theme in many Native American historical accounts, where they realized that they were losing their way of life through attrition. While the technological achievements of war played a significant role in the destruction of Native Americans' way of life, it was the farming techniques and technology which enabled larger populations of white individuals to survive and eventually outgrow the previous natives. With this advantage, portions of the white population that never had contact with these previous natives put pressure on those with contact to move them out of the way, and then ultimately demanded the federal and state governments to perform such tasks because these people in the more populated cities demanded recourse, they were they, they, they demanded resources they were far removed from. The nescience and, out, and outright ignorance of these people to understand the unintended consequences of their actions sowed destruction and hostility. And this is in part what's happening with the influx of immigrants into, Amer into American or, or Western cultures from the Middle East. They're making demands of us, and they're using our rules against us, just like the English and white settlers used some rules of the Native Americans against them. But in the case of the, that's a tangent I'm getting off on, and I don't want to avoid that, but in the case of the recent Standing Rock protests, U.S. police and or military have been deployed to supposedly do horrible things to the Native American protests in the name of people far removed from the situation and nation, if not intentionally ignorant of what's going on. 
I state supposedly after having done little research on the current aspect of this particular affair. However, my studies into U.S. history, they showcase the consistent reneging of contractual obligations by the federal government and state governments concerning ancestral lands and the like. The history between the federal and state governments and each respective Indian tribe, particularly in the Northeast, Midwest, Northwest, um, which they, they haven't been particularly great. In Dixie, they're only slightly better, but that's not noticeable to those who haven't studied the mid-1800s uh, history of the Indian tribes in the South. Uh, but no matter those uh, trifle differences, since the majority rules concept changes everything, making the issues at Standing Rock and the Dakotas something of importance right now. The land disputes in question need further clarity by the general public and law enforcement alike if a peaceful solution is to be made. All the little tidbits of interaction and history gathered leading up to this create the clarity needed in understanding the who, what, when, where, how, and why of the present situation that is seen as a racially motivated act of hostility by white people involved on the side of the oil pipeline and a defense of their racially motivated attacks on the other. And that makes it eerily similar to the way blacks are treated in the United States today in terms of common language, interests, and culture. The more the similarities uh, there are, the lower the chances of employing unwarranted aggression and the idea of a strong offense is a good defensive tactic. Yet, when Native Americans and blacks alike do things that are more in line with similar uh, and similar with what the majority uh, white population uh, wants, they're often very successful. Uh, if you take, for example, the casinos run by some Native Americans or the charter schools they've created, and look at the successful black businessmen in the world, especially in the United States, like Herman Cain, he, he, a former um, chain pizza shop owner and a presidential candidate, and Neil deGrasse Tyson, an amazing astrophysicist. I'm sure the local governments and, and federal government find ways to profit off these men very nicely. It's also less likely that they will be targeted by some stupidity because of their contributions to the majority's preferred norms. It can still happen, but their language, intelligence, and skill sets make them valuable to points that even lower IQ members of the majority will easily be able to recognize as important. There is no white privilege or racially based privilege until the issue of understanding majority privilege has been recognized and understood. This means that understanding historical context will illuminate the problems allowing us to make the corrections when necessary to avoid destructive hostilities and promote creative connections. This is better this is bettering future relations between all reason capable individuals able to communicate on relatively similar levels. Then when the majority concept is recognized, it would be fair to say that this version of majority privilege happens to be white in the United States. In Mexican towns it would be Hispanic privilege, in Beijing China it would be Chinese privilege, in the heart of the African continent it would be black privilege, but the issue is majority privilege with some sad with some subcategories. In, the ca in, in this case, it would be similar to understand the difference between patriotism and nationalism. In this evolution of the use of the word patriotism means to support, where nationalism is a specific kind of support for a country that is governed. Prior to nationalism, patriotism was about the devotion to a country too, directly. Now it's still associated with it, but akin to the way anarchy means chaos and also means without centralized rulers. But that's a topic for to be discussed in another time. Suffice it to say that the issue is a critical thinking problem rooted precisely in intellectual and emotional maturity. We identify with what we are most familiar with because of how we are taught or, we, or how we learn. This doesn't answer the question of why every law enforcement brutality encounter uh, between different, about different races or between different races. This, it, it does, however, put a large gaping hole in the idea that some with particular skin pigmentation or lack thereof in the United States somehow have magically intentional agreements between others akin to them in racial appearance that just let them off the hook with the absolute intent to avoid the most dastardly form of hostilities by other whites in positions of power over them. It's just not that simple. The truth is often far stranger and more complex than fiction in the fantasies and stories we tell ourselves, yet comprehension of complex ideas requires more intellectual development and maturity and work to recognize. And that is why I believe the fundamental problem lay in how we identify first with others and 
how that connects to our intelligence as individuals and groups. This is, of course, going to be taken the wrong way by so many people as if I'm calling certain groups stupid or smarter than the rest with intent to demean. The truth is that it's about individual context and full comprehension of that context. And what is the context? In a nutshell, it's that we all want to live peaceful lives free of destructive conflict. That is a very real possibility to make happen if we learn to control the only thing we can, ourselves as individuals, for the purpose of recognizing how our hasty and emotionally fueled and ill thought through actions often hinder greater possibilities in our future. But for now, I'd like to thank you for your time. If you found this helpful, please like, share, and give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to encourage more content like this, please visit my website, uh, jimlimmerdavis.com, to explore more of my work, share it with uh, friends, download free copies of my ebooks, Liberty Defined and Morality Defined, and please consider donating even just $1. Thank you so much for taking a peacefully proactive solution in bettering humanity's plight through comprehension and creation instead of ridicule and destruction.